We are going to... Hey everyone, welcome to our live stream. This is, we are Stan and Alicia Moulton at The Honey Company, and we are here to talk about geese. So we try to do a couple live classes every spring to help people who are looking at getting new beehives and just are interested in beekeeping in general. And uh, we try to teach you how to do the first couple things to get started. Um, we're hoping that this goes really well. And if it does, then we'd love to be able to continue this in the future too. So we are going to talk today about, um, let's see, our topic is buying a honeybee colony and like the equipment you need to get started with your first hive. So um, just introduction as people are kind of hopping on, welcome. If you want to post a comment with your name and where you're from, we'd love to say hi to you. Um, but Stan and I have been doing well, together for about 15 years, but Stan's been keeping bees for about 30. And he, I don't know, can I quote you while you're sitting right there? But he all he often says, like, I've killed more colonies than you ever will. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, right? I don't say it enthusiastically. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we've had a lot of experience and tried and failed and succeeded in lots of different ways. So um, we're excited to be here tonight and hope that you'll learn something from this class. Okay, so first thing to get started, I'm going to maybe ask questions and Stan is going to uh, answer. Is that okay? All right. Okay, so the first question um, that we get a lot is, oh, so I guess just as preface, preface for that, but we often, um, we get tons of questions over years of doing this. And so what we've done is collected all of our questions that we've had over a lot of long time and we created some online courses. And so hopefully these are questions that you have that, or maybe questions that you have, but you didn't know you have or something like that. Anyway, so we're going to start. Our first question is going to be, what is the difference between a colony and a hive? So Stan, what is the difference? Uh, when you refer to a beehive, it's just the bee housing. So there could be bees in it, but not necessarily. So a hive is what the bees are kept in. There's lots of different types of hives. So if you refer to the hive, we uh, usually know that you're talking about bees included, but not necessarily. Okay, that's awesome. So what I thought we could do is, um, I'll show you a picture of a hive, will that work? So here, right here, we have a beehive. It could have bees in it or not. Yep, and then what's a colony? So a colony of bees is the bees themselves. So that uh, consists of the queen and the worker bees and the drones and the comb they're building. So the colony could be a, a swarm hanging in a tree or they could be a colony living in uh, the rocks down in Arizona. They could be a colony living inside of a hive. So a colony is the bees themselves in a cohesive unit. There's different colonies. There's established colonies, nucleus colonies, feral colonies. Mm -hmm. You get the idea. Okay. And then, um, so what is an apiary? Apiary is uh, uh, more commonly here referred to as a bee yard, but an apiary is just a location where you're keeping bees. Could be one colony there, it could be more. So an apiary is the spot, uh, the location where a beekeeper keeps his bees. Okay, awesome. So we have, um, I well, what I try to do is um, have that. And then we have like some fun quizzes for you. So if you're on here with us, we're going to ask you to comment in. Yeah, and we'll see what you answer. But here's our quiz question for that topic. So true or false, a colony is a house that bees live in. So type your answer in the comments and we'll see what the answer is in just a second. Let's see. Okay. So we have a couple of people, but uh, so we'll show you the answer now. Okay. So the answer is false. A hive is the house that the bees live in. The colony can include both the bees and the hive. Okay. 
And so the second question is, the place that beekeepers keep a group of honeybee colonies is called A, a hive, B, an apiary, C, drone, or D, a brood. So answer in the comments what you think the answer to that one is. And I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, and so here we're going to show the answer now. And the answer is, it's B, an apiary. A hive is the house that bees live in. An apiary is the place where bee beekeepers keep a group of honeybees and Stan just said it's also called a yard. A drone is actually a male bee and brood refers to young developing bees. Okay, so hide that. All right, any questions? If you have any questions, let us know and we will um, yeah, answer them. So what time of year do people, like if people, if somebody wants to start keeping honeybees, what time of year would they order honeybees and equipment and get started? Um, depends on where you live, of course. So if you're in Hawaii, the answer is different than if you live in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So, but most places in temperate United States uh, where uh, we are at, so you're going to want to start about April 1st. So you're going to want to acquire your equipment. Be sure to order your bee suit and plenty of time for it to be shipped and arrived before the bees do. So um, you ought to uh, start thinking about ordering bees, ordering bee equipment in February, first part of March, in order to be ready for the bees in April. Mm -hmm. And some businesses start selling bees as early as January. We usually take and in our business, if you're local and want to buy bees from us, we start taking bees um, around February 1st, so around today. And then we continue taking orders until the pickup. So uh, that is, we take those orders at thehoneycompany.com. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, another question that people ask often is, won't my bees arrive after the fruit trees bloomed? Uh, they probably will. So sometimes, depends on the weather, depends on the year. Uh, around here, yeah, we always miss the apricots. If you want your apricots pollinated, I don't think we're going to be able to help you. Even package bees, the earliest you could get would probably miss apricots. They might get here in time for apples or peaches, plums, some of those others. But... Uh, Usually, the uh, pollination opportunity for fruit trees has passed by the time California has got their queens mated and packaged up and shipped out. So you'll need to plan for the next year, I guess. That's, um, that's the way it goes. So mm -hmm. uh, hopefully there's some established colonies or within a mile or two of you that you'll still get some pollination. Uh, one year, it was, uh, we relied on box elder bugs for pollination. <laughs> and they kind of did a good job, right? Anyway. There you go. Okay. So um, there are different ways that you can order colonies of bees. So um, Stan, tell us some of the different ways to order bees. So like packages, nukes, catching a swarm, that kind of thing buying an established colony where you talk about those yeah uh, i would recommend you don't try to buy an established colony sometimes people will think uh, they're just starting out and the best way to start out would be to get a colony that's already uh, overwintered two boxes high and ready to go that usually doesn't turn out good for beginning beekeepers if you're just starting out with bees you kind of need to grow up with your bees so you want to start out uh, and learn as they expand it gives you a little bit of time so package bees are bees that are in a cage and they'll, they're sold by the pound. They come with a mated queen and you uh, introduce those to your uh, equipment. Uh, nucleus colonies are uh, already established on five frames is typical for a nuke, sometimes four frames. And they'll have a queen that's already in the process of laying They'll have some brood, some uh, some eggs, drawn comb. They'll have some honey and some pollen already gathered. So all the things that an established colony does, only in miniature. Only it's just the nucleus of that established colony. And that's another popular way to purchase bees. 
nukes are, are usually a good, uh, good way to start. They take the risk out of a, a queen that uh, may not uh, perform well. Usually she does, but I'm just saying that if you are buying a nucleus, you've probably, uh, depending on how the, the uh, queen comes with that nucleus, but she's probably tested. Or in other words, she's been laying for a while and she's been observed to be doing well before you purchase her. So that alone right there is worth a little bit of extra cost, which isn't much that you would pay beyond uh, the price of package bees. Package bees can come in either uh, two pounds or three pounds. There's actually four pound packages. We don't carry those. Some people do. Um, and uh, those, are, those are consistent ways that you can get bees. Uh, if you want to try catching a swarm, you can. You can put up swarm traps. Trapping bees right now is a popular thing to do. Uh, you could cut out bees. So there might be somebody who has some bees that are living inside of a structure that they want removed. Uh, they're a nuisance there. And so you could, uh, doing cutouts so requires some experience handling bees. So if you're brand new to beekeeping, I don't recommend that. If you've got some experience keeping bees, then it's not a bad idea to, uh, uh, to participate in a cutout. Sometimes you'd have to get a new queen with a cutout if you if everything goes well. Uh, that's not a bad way to do it. Catching a swarm, so uh, local uh, municipalities will sometimes have a, uh, a place where you could get on a list with the fire department or the city office, and that if somebody calls up and has bees that have uh, showed up in their tree, they want somebody to show up and save the day and uh, rescue the neighborhood from the bees. So mm -hmm. they'll call you and you can go collect them. And uh, that uh, even if you do get a call for a swarm, it's not a guarantee that you're going to, to uh, house them properly, get them back to your place and have a queen that's doing well. Usually it works, but not always. It's not a sure thing. So the uh, most sure way to obtain bees and to get off to a good start with the least amount of risk is a nucleus and uh, next would be package bees next you might catch a swarm next if you're up for the experience you uh, you're not uh, worried about how much work it is to do a cutout or how much repair and remodeling it is after the work after the cutout is done then you might venture into something like that okay we have a question from a canadian beekeepers blog and it says what is your three what are your three pound packages worth should I answer that? Yeah. We're um, this year we're asking one hundred and sixty dollars. That is the same price as we had last year, and we're actually charging the same price for nucleus colonies as well. So, if you're we, however, we don't ship bees. So if you're in Canada, we can't get them to you. But if that's just um, if you're wondering prices, that's kind of where the ballpark is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it used to be a, a big uh, economy sending package bees up to Canada. So can't do that anymore, but um, I guess Canada can get them out of our, uh, Argentina, maybe, or New Zealand or Australia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have more questions about the details about um, which is better, packages versus nucleus colonies, I'm going to link in the show notes after we're done here. I'll link. We have a document that we call a beekeeping printable. It's part of our beekeeping renewables book, but um, it's called, which is better, our packages versus nucleus colonies. So I'll link um, directly to that so you can access that resource if you want to. Okay, the next question is um, talking about varieties of honeybees. And, you know, sometimes people wonder if they should get a carniolan queen, an Italian queen, a local queen. What, can you talk about different varieties of bees, of queen bees? Uh, sure. So the most popular, the two most popular right now in the United States, those are Italians and the Carniolans. So if you're wondering how, remembering, try to remember how to, what's that other variety that's not the Italians, but they're the darker one? Carnies, Carnies, Carniolans. That's how it's pronounced correctly. So we do have some Caucasians here. There's a few uh, Caucasian breeders that are still around. That's a uh, 
that's a nice bee that uh, that has some beneficial traits to it that uh, we would like to use more often. I, um, they tend to collect more propolis, though, is the reason why they're not used as often. They gum everything up. You get propolis over everything when you use those. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, if you've, uh, if you've studied up on propolis at all, we want propolis. Propolis is a good thing. That's a helpful thing, so we shouldn't breed against it. So uh, uh, we, uh, we, if there, well, let's look at it this way. Let's say if you had the choice between alive bees in the spring or dead bees in the spring, but the alive bees were the ones that made a sticky mess all over your gloves and your cell phone and your steering wheel and everything else you touch, what would you choose? Alive, sticky, messy bees? Or dead bees. We always want alive bees. We all want alive bees. So now we tried some Russian bees also this uh, last year. I bought some bees from Koi's. They um, we're uh, we're going to see how they do. So far, we're uh, I mean we're February first now, and they've overwintered very well. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to be uh, active a little more active earlier on. I uh, don't think they're going to build up real strong yet. That's why those Russians aren't typically used for almond pollination is because they're just now starting to uh, to brood up uh, seriously. So we have some high hopes that those will have better mite tolerance. That's why they were brought into the United States in the first place is mm -hmm. they're supposed to manage their varroa mite population better on their own. So the beekeeper doesn't have to. So uh, we'll try. We've tried Russians before and have had mixed results. Uh, we're trying some more right now. Stay tuned for some more uh, updates on the Russians. Now, we also have our feral bee project. We've mm -hmm. had these tested. I can't tell you exactly what variety they are. I can tell you what they aren't. They're not Africanized. They look like an Italian bee. But I can't honestly say that we've gained any uh, any uh, significant um, varroa resistance with them. Uh, which was kind of the hope. Uh, overall, we, we thought they might be a little tougher, but uh, they can die just like the rest of them when you bring them home and put them in a box. They're fine out wild. You bring them back to the city, put them in a beehive, and they'll die just like the rest of them. So <laughs> he's, uh, now, he's discouraged right yeah, now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the you, time of year. so let's just be honest about this. I mean, we were trying to build a reputation and a business that has something unique. Well, we have done more than our part. Uh, and the bee industry to help solve the problem with varroa mites. And, uh, well, it's not turning out uh, like we would want, but it's not over yet. We're still, it's continuing. We're, we're making some more progress, some more selection on our part, and some more testing might uh, get better results. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway, there's uh, the bees. Uh, people start reading the list uh, of uh, the different varieties of bees and the character traits that they're supposed to have. Uh, let's be honest. So there's probably no such thing as a purebred honeybee in uh, the United States anyway. There may be in other locations, but those are probably feral populations or wild populations of bees. And by the time they've uh, mixed in some European genetics with the Russian bees, um, they don't look that much different uh, as they do anymore. When we, we first got Russians, when they were first made commercially available, to people here in the United States, they were, they were, the queens were really black and they didn't have much hair on them. They looked like a black, skinny, long wasp and the Europeans did not accept them when you tried to introduce them. Now they just look like a carnion or a Caucasian bee. Uh, I guess they had to do that, uh, maybe not to make them make some honey, but may, maybe the better acceptance from them. So uh, if you know more about that subject, and you want to send us some comments and some emails about uh, what's been done since they've brought those in. Uh, great. So you hear something about different varieties of bees now and then they pop up, whether that's a while back we had the Minnesota hygienic. Well, that was a variety of Italians. Right now there's a popular bee, or at least it's being marketed and talked about some. Saskatraz, I think the name is. It's just another variety of Italian bees. It's not its own distinct variety of bee. It's not a different race of bee. So there's the uh, there's the Caucasian mountain bee or the Carniolan mountain bee. Or there there's a popular one up in Canada that's supposed to be the the savior of all uh, varroa varroa uh, 
suffering uh, beekeepers, uh, gray mountain bee or something like that. There, there, you know, there's the star line, there's the midnight, there's the, uh, there's the, uh, what's the, uh, um, there's the buck fast, there's on and on. These are just varieties of either Italian, Carnion, maybe Caucasian, probably not, maybe some Russians mixed in, not probably not, just those two varieties really that all these other bees have come from. So, um, and any breeder of these bees, anybody that has selected for a specific trait will tell you, well, you just take a variety of bees, whatever you've got, you select for a specific trait and you'll find the, the trait eventually that you're looking for in whatever you've got. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, so one, one, that was a long way around saying, <laughs> what, what kind of bees, uh, what's the different varieties of bees and what do you like and what works best? Well, we like the bees that are alive in the springtime. So that, and if you're a brand new beekeeper, that might feel like a lot of overwhelming variety and options, but maybe just pick something that's available locally to you. And maybe don't worry about the bees breed that much, especially the first year if you're keeping bees. And maybe just that's something that you can kind of experiment with down the line, but just get something that's locally available to you. And don't worry about being too picky about the variety. Yeah. Yep. If you're starting with bees, uh, maybe the most important thing to start with is, are your bees nice? <laughs> we like to work really nice bees. Last summer for the first time um, in that I can remember in my beekeeping career, I was working through the bee yard and I was the half the day was gone before I even remembered even put on my veil. I didn't wear a veil all day, no gloves and no veil. And I didn't have any stings at all. And uh, I, uh, I quite enjoy working on with bees that are uh, nice and gentle. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like that yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you're allergic to bees, then that's especially important. If you're a hobbyist and you're keeping bees in your backyard, and they're probably maybe closer to your neighbor's house than they are to your house, uh, then it's important to have some gentle bees that mm -hmm. aren't going to uh, cause any trouble. Yeah. Uh, in our area, there's like a nuisance class. So as long as your hive isn't annoying, I mean, you can keep bees unless they're bothering your neighbors or something. And then if they complain to the city, then you may have to move your colonies away from your backyard. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. We do you want to talk about what the Feral Bee Project is, like how it got started? Any yeah. Of that. Okay. Certainly. So the Feral Bee Project uh, began, I think it was 2007. So I was down in Southern Utah, the Four Corners area. We were on a horseback right out there. And I didn't, I wasn't really familiar with the area. I didn't know exactly where I was, but I was pretty sure there was no private property. We were out on BLM uh, ground, far away from any other commercial beehives. And I noticed some bees on some flowers. So I thought, um, well, it'd be nice to go bee hunting, do some bee lining maybe, or, or even just bring down some queens, some virgin queens, and let them mate with uh, local drones that uh, were feral. I assume they were feral bees. Uh, they've escaped from somebody's hive and slowly over the years moved out far away from town. So eventually they, they, uh, they uh, reached a distance where they would uh, be... Uh, considered feral and they weren't mating with other queens from in town. And so I saw that as an opportunity if they're alive and doing well on their own out there. I had to collect some of those genetics, mix them in with our other bees and see if we can't get a little bit tougher bee. Uh, so uh, that's what we did. And um, we've uh, been experimenting with these bees. We've been catching down the Four Corners area. Since then, I've, uh, I've, uh, collected some stories along with the bees about uh, wild bees down in that area, specifically down on the Navajo Nation. We did a cutout down there and uh, visited with some of the old timers down there. And they've got stories when they were kids, uh, 60, 70 years ago, uh, encountering bees living in the rocks in different places uh, far, far away from where there would be any, any, any beekeepers. And so we know there's been bees down there for a long, long time. And if they're surviving on their own without help or interference, I maybe I should say that say that differently. Without help from a beekeeper, they don't need our help. <laughs> they're just fine on their own. As soon as we try to interject our help, and then they uh, they die. So uh, anyhow, 
I think he's having a negative, yeah, a pessimistic time about yeah. these. But we try to, you know, increase the hardiness and um, local adaptability through the Feral Bee Project. So let's see. Um, do you guys do you guys have any questions? Please reach out. Um, hi, Swarm. Let's see, Swarmstead Bee and Gardening. Welcome. We're glad you're here. And um, if you have any questions as we're going along, please ask them and we'd love to, um, yeah, we'd love to answer those. So uh, we have, do you guys want to do an, some more quiz, quiz questions? They're kind of fun. Maybe tell us too, if you've got some comments for us or some questions, tell us where you're from. We've got some uh, somebody mm -hmm. from Canada watching and uh, it'd be interesting to see uh, where everybody else is from. Yeah. Okay. So in the meantime, while we're waiting for more comments to come, we'll say, this is our, let's see, let me share. I'm learning new technology. Okay, so this is a picture. What is it? That's the question. What is this? Is it A, a hive, B, a nuke, C, a frame, or D, a package cage or a package of bees? Okay, so answer in the comments which one you think it is, A, B, C, or D, and we'll reveal the answer in just a second. Okay, so, or you could pause because it's, Anyway, after it's live, you can pause. Okay, so the answer is that this is D, a package cage. So let's see, another question is, okay, I'll go back to this one. What time of year do beekeepers order honeybees in North America? Is it A, January to April, B, April to June, C, July to September, or D, October to December? So you can answer that in the comments or just in your own brain or whatever. Incidentally, too, so if you're ordering queen bees, mm -hmm. it's really tough to get a queen bee the first week in April. That's when everybody wants their bees, mm -hmm. and that's the earliest that the producers can get bees. Mm -hmm. And so you want to plan ahead, especially, you're, you, let's say you've got an established colony last fall, it's doing well, it's getting through the winter okay, and you want to split it. So you just want to order a queen bee. So you better get your queen bee in as early as they'll take an order, wherever mm -hmm. you're getting it from. So uh, just uh, just a heads up there. Okay, so let's see. The answer to this question is, oh, we have some comments, people answering. Oh, okay, Mark Bishop, hey, thanks for your question. We'll get to that in just a second. Okay, before I go to those, I'm just going to show the answer to this one so I don't get too out of off track. Okay, so the answer is A, January to April is the time that you order bees in North America. And then our... Let's see, we'll do one more question real quick and then I'll read all of your questions from your comments. So true or false? Oh, did we talk about that? We didn't talk about that. So we, let me go to comments. <laughs> okay. So we said, Mark Bishop says, do you collect bees from the four corners area this year? And Mark is a Stan's cousin. So <laughs> hi, Mark. Uh, I didn't go down there this uh, last summer. So the uh, opportunity to have some uh, virgin queens mated down there would go through about uh, uh, it's a little warmer down uh, blanding area so let's say maybe the last week in march through the latest that i've been able to get queens mated down there was the first week i'm remembering the 8th of october um, anyway i didn't make it down there this year we were just too busy doing other stuff um, so, uh, I don't have any, any queen bees from this last year. We still have some queen bees from that feral bee project, but, uh, none from last year. Yep. Okay. And some years it's just hard to get there with, you know, yep. life. Okay. So hi, Swarm said bee, bees and gardening. It was great to see you again. Thanks for tuning in. And then Marmy's farmstead, farmhouse. Hi. Welcome, Laura. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Some of the some of you we've uh, that are watching we met at the uh, Bee Expo in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So thanks for joining us. It was good to meet you there, and uh, good to see you again. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so let's see. Let's talk about. Can we talk about the different types of beehives? So if you're getting a hive, you want to choose equipment to use for your bees. What do you choose? That kind of thing. Right. There's uh, there's a lot of influencers out there you know, mm -hmm. on the different 
types of beehives, and uh, which is great. Uh, some of them have, have, have more experience than others, but uh, the uh, most common type of hive that people are keeping bees in is the Langstroth. Mm -hmm. So Reverend Langstroth invented, or let's say he didn't invent, the bees invented the bee space. Mm -hmm. He only acknowledged it and designed a hive around it. Mm -hmm. And so that's the uh, common uh, 10 frame Langstroth deep is what's most common for the brood chamber and uh, quite often the supers also. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, because it's the most common, I would say it's the easiest for beginning beekeepers to use. There's quite a variety of equipment surrounding it. And uh, there, the literature that has been written, if you're reading bee books, is going to be based uh, mostly on the uh, Langstroth hive. So I would recommend starting with the Langstroth. Mm -hmm. So uh, that doesn't, uh, so that's that's us. Now, I, I didn't include the bees in that decision or that recommendation. So your bees themselves don't care what they live in, really. Anybody that's ever done a cutout will know. They'll live in a, quite a variety of spaces and shapes and sizes. And and uh, so if you want to keep bees, if you've, uh, if you've determined that uh, horizontal beekeeping is, is better, all right, then go ahead and do it. We won't argue with you. In fact, we'll encourage you. If you want to keep your bees in a, a horizontal and a top bar hive, go right ahead and do it. There's uh, Warry hives. There's uh, right now there's a popular hive. It's the uh, Layens hive. That's mm -hmm. a little bit bigger frame. So there's a continuous uh, brood chamber, um, which incidentally isn't that much bigger than the old uh, Dayton hive or the Jumbos. Uh, some countries are still using jumbos. I build a jumbo and I've got bees in it. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if they're alive uh, right now or not. I haven't checked on that one, but uh, it's a little bit bigger frame. So it's the same top bar dimension mm -hmm. of the frame, but it's a little bit deeper. It's an extra deep frame. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, we're. Uh, I've got some, some plans coming up. We're going to... Uh, talk about different types of hives and uh, um, we're going to encourage people to use some different types of hives. I've got uh, I've got some really fun things in store. I hope we're able to put them together. I've got a, a couple other beekeepers that are on board with, uh, um, I don't know when's the best time to la launch it. Watch for our next live episode and maybe we'll, uh, we'll be ready, ready to launch the Revive the Hive. <laughs> We're going to take some old, I'll give you just a little preview. Okay? Yeah, let's keep working on it and yeah. we'll work, we'll keep workshopping. All right. All right. Okay. So let's see. Um, also, I just wanted to say that Langstroth hives, some, there are some beekeeping tasks that you have to do over the summer that it's just, some of them are easier in a Langstroth hive. Like if, when you need to divide a colony or provide room for expansion. Extracting equipment too is uh, revolves around the Langstroth mm -hmm. size of frame too. So that's another thing to consider. Mm -hmm. How are you going to harvest it? That might uh, have some influence on the hive design that you dis decide to use. And not to plug a certain brand, but the Flow Hive, for example, is a specific type of Langstroth hive. So it, right, it's, it just is a modified Langstroth hive. So if you're wondering about that, that's an option as well. And, and that is just a, yeah, it's a deep Langstroth hive that has some modifications to make it so you can extract from the frames. Okay, because people are wondering about that, I'm sure. All right, Um. so we talked about, so the, he was talking about different types of hives and some that are, that have kind of stood the test of time. And I don't know, there's some common ones are the top bar hive, the worry hive and the Langstroth hive. And we classify those hives by whether the bees expand horizontally or vertically, and then whether they have a frame or whether they just have a top bar. So um, when I'm saying horizontal hives, that's something like the top bar hive that is a horizontal hive that just has a top bar typically. And um, so there's just one piece of wood along the top and then bees build comb down around it. And then hives like 
The Langstroth hive is a vertical hive, so when you're adding more room for the bees as they grow over the year, you're stacking more boxes on top instead of moving a following board over like you would in a top bar hive. And um, then traditionally Langstroth hives have a frame, so they have four pieces of wood, a top bar, two sidebars, and a bottom bar that frame the comb that bees produce, and they kind of give some structural support that way. And then um, the worry hive is also a vertical hive, but it has top bars. So I don't know, those are just kind of some basic uh, information about different kinds of hives. We do recommend that you get a Langstroth hive just because the components are easier to find sometimes. And anyway, it just makes some jobs easier. But again, like Stan says, that you can do any of the hives and the bees don't care and they'll grow and they want to grow and thrive in whatever hive. Okay, so let's talk about, we're gonna focus specifically on the Langstroth hive and the different components of it. So we brought um, some equipment to show you. Do you wanna grab that and we'll show them. Maybe let's start with the bottom. Or do you want, yeah. The bottom of this hive is attached. I've got it screwed up. So it's separate though from the box. So it's, uh, uh, if you move bees a lot, like I do, then uh, you want to attach the bottom down or you want to have them on a pallet. In any case, I've screwed on the bottom board onto the hive body. So I have a lid. So there's different, different types of lid. Commercial beekeepers are gonna use a flat lid. So you can stack hives on top of each other when you're moving them. And next to each other. Yes, and this one is a migratory, so it's flush with the sides. So uh, when you stack the bees, either on a pallet or on the truck, uh, then they'll uh, fit flush. And when you strap them down, you tie them down to the truck, then they won't move around because they're tight against each other. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the idea. So migratory meaning, uh, it's co most commonly used by beekeepers who move their bees a lot. Uh, all right. And then a telescoping lid is the other kind of lid, and it like telescopes over all four sides of the box. Yeah. And those can be good if you're going to keep your bees in one place and not move them around. But they're a little bit more expensive than just a migratory style hive. So for beginning beekeepers, that uh, telescopic lid comes with an inner cover. And so if you're using a migratory lid, it's easy to take your hive tool and put it in the space on the side and you can you can break open the propolis seal that the bees stick it down with. So if you have a telescopic lid that's fitting over the sides and you can't get your hive in there to, to uh, crack apart the, the bees. Mm -hmm. So there'll be an inner cover with a telescopic lid. Those are good lids. And if you're never going to move your bees, I'd recommend using a telescopic lid. Uh, they uh, they shed the rain. So if there's rain and snow melt comes off of there, there's not a chance for it to leak into the hive. Mm -hmm. It's a little better to have uh, something over the edge. So with a telescoping lid, you take off the telescoping lid. That's not sealed with a propolis seal. And then there'd be like a, the inner cover basically covers this whole thing and you use your hive tool to pry that off. That's what the propolis seal will be. We, yeah. We've got a hive with an inner cover. I'll show you that in just a sec. Oh, awesome. All right. Okay, so the next part of the hive, oh, so we talk about the box. So the box itself, mm -hmm. typically a box is made uh, from wood. There's other designs out right now. You can uh, buy a plastic beehive or, or styrofoam or styrofoam beehive mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, typically three quarter inch and um, it has on the ends uh, it has a groove cut in there to accommodate the ears on your frames so you can see the groove here all right typically uh, the Langstroth box will hold 10 frames this is a frame feeder that you can replace a frame with a feeder that if you want to feed the bees syrup you can use that 
Um, and then it's called a frame because it frames the comb, like the bees will build comb in this space. And there's a bar on each side that frames it, right? And some people call them trays, but the technical word is a frame. Yeah. Yep. So you want to tell them about foundation or foundation, sir? Sure. So you can get plastic foundation or wax foundation. And this has, um, I hope you can see, oh yeah, hexagon stamped into it. Um, and then this piece of plastic is sprayed lightly with beeswax so, to attract the bees to it. So um, this provides like a surface for bees to build the comb out. So they'll take um, and build wax along each of those little ridges so that there's hexagon shapes all over it. So um, we give them this, sometimes it just supports the comb to have a piece of foundation in the middle, but this is a foundationless frame and a deep frame is too, typically too deep to support a whole continuous piece of comb. So we put these middle bars in there to just give it extra support. And um, this is something that we just DIY and you can do that too if you want to. Um, and then this is like still a deep frame, but it's kind of like two shallows, but we can also the cut comb dimensions that we use anyway are four by four so they fit perfectly in here so you can um have a frame with foundation or without foundation people who like to avoid plastic sometimes go with foundationless and but if you don't mind having some plastic and want a little bit more stability then this works we've put both of these through the extractor and once this is built all the way to all the corners it can go through an extractor and be okay but um, it is a little bit fragile before they get there for extracting. Anything else? Bees like plastic. Do they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, one thing is that we used to really advocate foundationless frames and still are still a great option. But we noticed that if you put a whole row of 10 frames foundationless frames in a colony that sometimes bees build their comb. They're supposed to build it parallel to this. Well, we think they're supposed to, right? But sometimes they'll go in and they'll build it crosswise or they'll build it rogue, not on, in the frame. So if you do want to try using foundationless frames, it's a good idea to alternate one frame that's foundationless and then with one with either drawn comb already or foundation just so that they don't build a big comb that goes across spans several frames it's really really hard to clean that up um either that or you can go in there and check really often and make sure you know if they start building and then it kind of veers out you can use your hive tool and just kind of push it back so that it's in the frame otherwise you can't get your frames out <laughs> yeah yeah, so uh, bees building cross comb is a temporary problem. Mm -hmm. And if you're attentive, you can catch it before it gets uh, out of hand. Once it gets full of honey, then it's a mess to try and straighten it out. But mm -hmm. Once you've got it built in there straight, you've uh, helped the bees or at least uh, kept an eye on the bees, mm -hmm. then uh, you're good to go for it. Yeah, you, and you can reuse the, the advantage to having a frame is that we can extract the honey without completely destroying the comb, right? Like we can spin it out in a centrifuge extractor and then we can save the comb and give it back to the bees. And then instead of having to rebuild that comb, they can just put more honey in it or lay more eggs in it or whatever they're gonna do in it, like right away. Maybe some small repairs, but it saves the bees a lot of energy because it takes, they have to eat honey to be able to produce wax. So it takes some energy. Um, let's see, we have a comment here. Okay, let's see. So Laura says, is it okay to mix a foundation frame with a plain frame in the same hive box? Absolutely, you can, we just now, we were just recommending, you know, alternating foundationless foundation, foundationless foundation throughout the whole box. So it is okay to do that and you can mix and match that however you want to. And um, yeah. Oh, and she said, maybe we already answered her question, but that just to clarify that. Thanks for asking. Um, let's see. So we talk about, so he referred to this box. This is a deep box. Boxes come in three depths. This is a deep one. How deep is it? I can never remember the measurements, but he builds them all the time, so he knows. The, the frame is about nine and an eighth inches, maybe a little more. 
Depends on the manufacturer. The box is nine and five eighths mm -hmm. deep. Yep. So uh, the dimensions of the box are really specific. So if you could see inside the box, like the wall of the box, let's see, make sure I'm on camera. The wall of the box is here and they build it so that these um, frames are the B space, have a B space like that scant three eighths of an inch between the wall of the box and the edge of the frame. And then between the bottom of the frame and the next frame below it or the bottom board and then the top of the frame and the frame above it so that there, that B space is consistent all the way around. Um, if you choose to use foundation, um, often foundation will come with these communication holes. These like those holes, let's see if I can see it better if I put my hand there. These like these holes to be at the bottom. Some um, foundation does not come with those, but we actually use our saw. Stan uses the saw to cut little corners there so that they can kind of move back and forth between frames through those holes. He's right. like having pathways. Nice thing about the, the middle bar frame is, is when they fill this up with comb, they'll they'll leave some holes here for them to crawl through. And that's especially important, maybe this time of year, if the bees need to get over another frame where the honey is, because they've consumed all the honey off of this frame and they want to move over, if they've got some holes there they can crawl through, and that's helpful to them, especially in the wintertime. Yeah. So like I was saying before, this is a deep box, but boxes also come in medium and they come in shallow. And so the this width of the box would be the same, but the depth of the box could be this big or it could be medium or shallow. So um, and then like Stan was talking about before, there's also a jumbo box that some people use. Some countries they use that pretty normally. And um, we, in the United States, we kind of stick with deep as the biggest, um, unless, anyway, depending on your hive style. And then just to complicate it even more, these, this is a 10 frame box and some boxes only hold eight frames. So you need to know the difference between a 10 frame and eight frame equipment because they're not interchangeable. You know, if I have a 10 frame box and try to put an eight frame box on top of that, it's going to be narrow and there's going to be a gap sticking out here. So you need to pick one of those and stick with it, eight frame or 10 frame within one hive. Um, and it's probably a good idea to, if you're going to pick eight frame equipment for one hive or 10 frame, then just to do that across all of your hives so that your equipment is more interchangeable. So Stan runs mostly all deep boxes. And then the cool thing about that is that any frame fits in any box in any apiary. So he can move things around and there's some uh, management things that are easier because he decided to do that. He has, he does have some other size boxes, but that's, do you still prefer that? Yep. Okay. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna just show you a picture really fast of um, deep, medium and shallow boxes. So you can kind of see the difference. So this one here on the, it, to me, it's on the right. It might be, it's the deepest one. That's a deep box. And then the center one is a medium box. And the one on the other side, the shallowest is a shallow box. Okay. And so those are eight, all 10 frame boxes. And then, oh, so here's another view. See the shallow box and the medium box aren't very different, but the medium and the deep are more different. So this is them stacked on top of each other. And then I'm wondering if we have... Anyway, if you're looking to build your own equipment, here's a video there you can find on YouTube about how to build, how Stan built his boxes. So um, those are some, those are the different sizes. They're all 10 frame, but again, just watch out. There might be eight frame and you just need to make sure that you get the same width of box, if that makes sense. Okay, um, so we'll go back to this. All right. Um, anything else you wanted to say about boxes? Uh, no, I guess not. Unless we've got, yes, I have lots more to say about different <laughs> hive designs coming up in the future. <laughs> For now, I guess, uh, I guess not. So unless you've got some comments or questions, we'll read comments and we'll entertain questions too. Send us in some questions about things. Yeah. Oh, I just found, maybe I found a picture. of it. Okay. I'm going to just show you this really fast because I found a picture here. So this is um, an eight frame box next to a 10 frame box. So you can see the difference in the width, right? So these are both deep boxes, but 
one is holds two more frames, so it's wider. Okay. All right. Would you like to talk about the barn hive now? Oh, that's a good idea. Um, we have a special, I don't know, like a cool hive design that is a, it's just a modified Langstroth hive that we want to show you. Yeah, we'll show it to you because it's really pretty and you might, you might really like to have one of these for your apiary at home. Like if you're in a home garden, they're really pretty and they look really nice in the yard. Okay. Maybe you saw this if you were at the Kentucky Bee Expo. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, we were demonstrating how this works. Uh, so think of this. Uh, there's several ways to think of this. So it's the same footprint as a 10 frame Langstroth hive, and it holds the same frame as a Langstroth. Um, you could think of it as a uh, garden top with uh, a bunch of goodies in it, or you could think of it as a new box. So. It'll have uh, a pitched roof, so uh, we can remove that. And then uh, we mentioned an inner cover earlier. It has uh, an inner cover, so this will be more like a telescopic lid. Because it fits, um, oh, it telescopes over the sides. Yeah, yeah. With, an, with an inner cover. And then inside we have a new box, so you can put... Uh, you can put your deep frame into a five frame nuke box uh, above it. And yeah. it has on either side, it has a, a, a feeder on this side. You can put a gallon of syrup in that. It's built in. So you uh, can feed the bees without disturbing them. So the bees can crawl into there. Yep. And, and then on, the, on the other side, it has an observation window. You've got glass. And so you can open up this bay of the barn and look in here and check on your bees' progress. And it also has a space in here that you can put your tools. So if you uh, want to put an extra hive tool in there, some smoker fuel, matches, lighter, queen marking tube, pushing cage, whatever you uh, whatever you might uh, get to the apiary and have forgotten, and you can use that. So. That is not necessarily a different type of hive. It's just uh, an adaptation and accessory to the original Langstroth. So if you're thinking of the Langstroth hive with its flat top as boring, <laughs> you might be right, but here's a way to jazz it up a bit. Jazz it up. Get, get, Some a little, get a little fancy with the beehives. Mm -hmm. uh, if you... Uh, like the idea of the standard Langstroth equipment and its popularity over the years, and uh, but you want something a little bit unique, there's the barn hive for you. It's just real pretty. <laughs> okay, so you, I'll put a link after the this is over to where you can find the barn hive on our website. Um, so Stan, we had a question yep. from Antonio. Hello from Tennessee. Thank, welcome, we're glad you're here. Um, he says, have you tried dual nukes with two queens and a queen in excluder? So if you're a new beekeeper, you probably don't need to try that this year. <laughs> maybe later, but maybe you could speak to that. Yeah. So uh, the idea is if you put two queens together, they're going to fight. But the worker bees, they don't care well who their queen is within, within reason. So you would have... Uh, a setup where you have a uh, hive here. We would put another hive just like it, and then we could put a queen excluder over the top of the hives so the queens can't crawl over and fight with each other, right? But uh, when you put a super on top of that, the uh, foraging bees, the worker bees, can enter either hive that they want to that's on top, and then they can go down into this hive or they can crawl over into the hive next to it uh, with, uh, with a different queen. So the reason that uh, that's uh, popular is that two queens will lay twice the amount of brood and twice the amount of brood, hopefully and eventually, uh, turns into twice the amount of nectar gatherers. So you've got a uh, big, much bigger foraging force and you can make a lot more honey with a two queen system. So um, I've tried in various, uh, various formations and uh, variations on that idea. 
uh, to have more than one queen in a hive. And it works well. People will get good results with this uh, when there's a good nectar flow on. Mm -hmm. Eventually, those bees, even though while they're busy working during the summertime, aren't going to argue about uh, which queen they like better. But eventually, they're going to settle on one queen or the other. And uh, sometimes uh, there's different things that could uh, that would um, trigger a uh, queen balling incident. Let me say, uh, sometimes a disturbance from the beekeeper, or sometimes it's just a seasonal changes when the nectar flow is over, winter's coming on. Um, they they uh, you have to keep an eye on them uh, on both of those queens. We've got a fun picture on our website too of of two queens, both of them are marked. And they're just busy working together right on the same frame. So, and that wasn't with a two queen uh, excluder uh, partition type of uh, uh, hive either. So, were they mother daughter or? They're probably a mother daughter situation where one of the, the, uh, the old queen, the mother was being uh, superseded and uh, phased out. And, but they were still busy in there working working together at the time so mm -hmm. and you might be surprised at how often if you're raising a lot of queens and you're uh, uh you're in you're uh, in the beehive looking for queens quite often you'll be surprised how how often there will be more than one queen in the same hive. so usually it's not a permanent situation eventually they settle on one queen uh, you can even have more than two queens uh, in a hive. You could have, you could have Don't some nuke, box, nuke boxes set up and the excluders over all of them. And then the foragers are coming in and going whichever one they want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can, and, uh, um, and you use we queen up, castles. Yeah, we, yeah. Set, we have, uh, we set up a queen bank every year with our extra queens. So once we've raised a bunch of queens or we've ordered a bunch of queens, it's best to have those in the bees, uh, having the bees take care of them until they find their new and permanent home. And we'll put in, you know, there might be, there might be 60 uh, queen bees all in the same hive, all being attended to by the same worker bees. So it's possible to set it up. That was maybe a little more in depth uh, than Antonio was asking. I don't know. Uh, um, he has a good suggestion here that you could make the barn hive a double long Langstroth hive with a queen excluder. That'd be cool. Okay. You yeah. can totally do that. That's a great idea. So uh, now so now, stay in touch with us, Antonio, because I got something coming up about some different hive designs and ways to manipulate this thing. You're probably going to like it. If you're asking questions and thinking about that kind of thing, mm -hmm. we're going to have fun with this one. So stay tuned. Awesome. Okay. And Lara says, that looks amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay. Um. Let's see. Oh, I'm. I was going to say for those of you who are brand new, we're going to um, include a, a resource called, a, which is like a checklist for buying your first hive, like all the things you need to get. Um, maybe we could talk about. Let's see. For assembling your hive, sometimes you buy unassembled hives. So they're less expensive because shipping is easier when they're unassembled. And if that happens, and if you get um hives that are smooth on one side and then rough on the other side like assembling them we want to let's see their bees put propolis in every rough spot in their hive they like to smooth things out they like to cover things in propolis and propolis is really beneficial to bee health and the more propolis bees have the more health benefits you'll see so with that said we encourage you to assemble the boxes with the smooth side on the outside and the rough side on the inside. Yes. So we want to encourage propolis. I mean, they make hives that are like really roughed up on the inside. Those can be good too, but just give them some spots that they need to, we want them to create as much of a propolis envelope. I'm like off camera. They want, we want them to create as much of a propolis envelope as they can. So there was, if you were in attendance at the uh, Kentucky Bee Expo, there was, and I forget the uh, company now, but they have uh, extremely roughed up. They've taken uh, a uh, hive body uh, made out of wood, and they've got uh, quite a bit of texture on the inside, encouraging the bees to put more and more propolis in there. Yeah. So, and if you were at that expo, and maybe you attended Marlott's Bivac's, um, 
uh, lectures, she talked about propos. You want to give them just the overview of what she said? Yeah, well, I mean, I am a huge admirer of her, so it was really cool to see her in person. But um, they did a bunch of research, and basically, I mean, that is the takeaway that the more propolis that is in the hive, the more health benefits that the colony will receive. And that will be benefits to their hive immunity and bees like seek propolis as like a curative um, thing. Like if they have a certain disease or fungus or something that they don't want in their hive, they seek propolis. That's like the answer to that. And yeah, just basically the more those roughed up hives like Stan was talking about are um, making the greatest amount of propolis envelope within the colony. So, um, and then propolis is like pretty amazing. And she talked in depth about all of the different, excuse me, ways that propolis is beneficial, like it's antiviral, antibacterial, and just promotes the bee um, health as a colony organism. Like they're like, what's it called? The comprehensive immunity that they have together as a group. Anyway, so the more propolis, the better it is for the bees. Um, even though it's a sticky mess for us, it's still worth it. Um, so that's a little bit about propolis. We can talk more about that. Let's see. Okay. Awesome. We love, so one of the coolest parts about being a beekeeper, especially if you are like to do woodworking is to create your own hives and inventions. And that's a really cool part of it. So Antonio says, um, Advoco, I don't know how to say that, makes an interesting hive design with a plastic keg bottle. I'll have to check that out. Okay. I think I, I think I know. Yeah. Have you seen that? And then he also says, there's a YouTube video by this guy about about it. Do you watch YouTube too? Yeah, send us the link. We'd love to see that video too. That'd be awesome. Okay. And then, or we can look it up too, but if you have it on hand. And then he wants to know, what are your thoughts on flow hives? Do you want me, can I, talk? I have a couple flow hives. I haven't used them yet. I'm always too busy doing something else. Yeah, so. we don't, we don't have a lot of personal experience with it, mostly because we own extracting equipment. And for us, like to be able to extract extract from any frame in the colony is an advantage. We know people and we've um, worked with them like in a mentorship kind of situation where they do have flow hives and it does work that they you put the crank in and you turn it and honey does flow out. Sometimes it can get clogged and it's hard to clean. Um, but the main thing is that sometimes the flow hive promotional videos makes it look like beekeeping is a hands-off sort of um, experience, but it's not. You, we need to be in our hives checking and making sure the bees is have enough room for expansion, that they're free from disease, and that the queen is thriving in the hive. And so it's, it is a, a thing where you need to inspect your bees regularly, you know, every 10, seven to 10 days through the summer. And sometimes it makes it look a little bit tur too turnkey. Like we've had people asking us specifically, like, so I don't really need to do anything all summer. That's not true. You have to be in your colonies. You have to inspect them. You have to, um, you know, be a good steward over your hives as you're keeping these. My first experience with the flow hive, one of our customers had, um, purchased bees from us and he wanted me to come up and have a look at them with him and help him out and the flow hive the flow frames in the flow hive were clear full of green nectar somebody green. in the neighborhood was feeding their hummingbirds mm. dyed syrup and the bees were getting in their hummingbird feeder and it was green Mm -hmm. So now you've got a problem where you couldn't get into the flow frames. You could drain it, of course, but would that guarantee you got all the green out? If it was uh, a situation like that with just your regular frame, especially a uh, foundationer's frame, well, you could just cut all that green out. Um, and uh, But if it's in a flow frame... You may have some trouble getting all of that out of there so that your next, uh, once you've got the bees working on a legitimate nectar source, uh, then you wouldn't have any more green honey residue. Dang, I wish we had a picture of that. <laughs> That'd uh, be a cool so, one. Anyway, 
So there's there's pros and cons to things. And I would if when anybody asks me about the flow hive or any other new invention or any different kind of hive, uh, my first reaction is I hope they succeed. We want people to design new hives and uh, come up with new ways. Part of the fun of being beekeepers, uh, beekeepers like to tinker with things. They like to make their own little stuff. And then more of that, the better, because that's where new ideas come from. That's where innovation comes from. And uh, so anybody that's designing a new hive or a new bee tool, uh, more power to you. I hope it works. And uh, if, you, if I can help you make it work, even the better. Okay. So having said that, you know my position on hoping somebody else succeeds. I wish you well. There are a few concerns about it, though, that uh, um, there's cons and there's pros to it. So if you want to try the hive, uh, the flow hive, do it. Uh, go ahead. I mean, they work. If they didn't work at all, they would have been gone a couple of years ago. Yeah. So. Okay. So another question that we have, we get often is it is, is it okay to buy used equipment? And so is it okay if I start on that? And the... We recommend that you start with new equipment, but it's possible that you can start with used equipment if you clean it up properly. So the trick the trick is that um, wax comb can store pesticides and diseases. So um, you'd want to watch for that. And then so specifically, American fowl brood can be stored as spores in the wooden equipment. And so you'd want to make sure that they're you're getting it from healthy bees. And it's just not, it's just hard to know for sure if you have um health if they had healthy bees or not. So that, but otherwise, except for American fowl brood, then it's okay to reuse your own equipment because you know if your own bees had that. Um and that, but that is the concern with used equipment. Or, the difficult part about American fowl brood is you have to smell it to be able to identify it. <laughs> and so if you've never encountered it before, how do you know what it smells like? Mm -hmm. And so I would do some research, though, and uh, look up some pictures of AFB, American fowl brood. And uh, so do your best to be able to identify that if you're thinking of uh, buying used equipment. And uh, if you... Uh, if you suspect there might be American fowl brood, then by uh, by all means, don't use that equipment. Right. Other than that, stuff could be looking pretty ratty, pretty old, pretty uh, pretty bad, and still be usable, still be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. the bees, the bees can clean up uh, some pretty big messes. Mm -hmm. We catch bees uh, in our uh, hives that just move in. A swarm of bees might move in, and sometimes they pick the. The most grossest. disgusting, grossest box. It's like had mice red. in it. It's had you know, to move into, and they clean it up and move in. And uh, mm -hmm. anyway, so I wouldn't uh, necessarily be afraid of used equipment, uh, but I would be able to identify that one thing. If you can just remember AFB, you need to be able to identify if it's got American fowl brood. If there's no signs of American fowl brood, then clean it up if you can. Use it, reuse it. Uh, might as well. Yeah. Since throwing it away. And then um, another thing is that if you are interested in learning more about bee diseases, we have a course, one of our online courses, we have six of them. One, oh, I'm off camera. Six of them. One of them is Are My Bees Healthy? And it will go over um, the best you can online of identifying American fowl brood and has pictures and descriptions of the different smells in the hive and things like that. So I recommend getting our online courses. They're really worth the money because it'll be a, it's a really good span of a, a ton of different beekeeping information. Okay. So Antonio says, let's see, have you ever studied the stingless bees that occur in South, South America, like Mexico, India, and Australia? They are little and make smaller hives and a thinner watery honey. There's some interesting hives made there. Um, I've, I have, I've studied them. Yes, I know about them. Uh, I don't have any experience, of course, we don't keep them up here. So I don't have any other experience with them. But uh, um, if they're alive in the spring, I'm interested in those. Bees. <laughs> they, it says, they, they have interesting hives made just for them, the comment got cut off. And I wonder why we can't have them in the States. And I think that the reason we don't have them here so much is that it's cold. Well, at least where we are, it's too cold. 
Yeah, you know, like maybe they do tropical. fine in Florida or California or uh, some Tennessee. Uh, maybe yeah. if your weather is warm enough. Yeah, I don't know that. It's probably political. It's probably the <laughs> Act Department and the government uh, agencies involved with that. Um, maybe don't want them here for lots of different reasons. Uh, so uh, um, that's all I have to say about that. Is that they're worried, probably worried that they're going to bring in something like Veralmite or Tropolalops or good grief, who knows what else. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, let's see. Another thing that we wanted to cover tonight, just for beginning beekeepers, is should I paint my hives? So, um, you can paint your hives. We don't always paint our hives. You, it just depends on your aesthetic. If you paint them, they'll last longer. This was painted. It's coming off. It was a varnish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so every few years, you got to do it again. Let me quote C.C. Miller. Okay. So he said he was in the business, he was running a bee business, and it was uh, um, more worth his time just to have to replace a box now and then rather than keep up with the paint. Every <laughs> few years, you got to paint it again. And so if you have like a hive and it's just going to be in your garden and you want it to look pretty, of course, paint it and make it look beautiful and do all of that. But it's okay if you don't, And but it will extend the life of your boxes if you do paint them. So, yep. Yeah. We, Stan typically uses, he uses marine varnish often and he uses just white exterior paint. And then sometimes he does silver with grit in it because it's something his grandpa did too. Okay. Um, Antonio says mason bees, oh, mason bees can be kept in a greenhouse. Have you ever messed with mason bees? There's a company where you can rent them for a greenhouse. Um, I've never kept them before myself. Uh, we used to sell beekeeping equipment and honey and bees at a, at a, uh, store that sold mason bee and blue orchard bee equipment. Mm -hmm. And so we do know of them. They're really efficient pollinators. Um, uh, they, uh, they've got a specific job that they do and they do it well. Uh, yeah. So honey bees are great pollinators, um, you know, on a variety of different crops. So, uh, Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, those are a lot of fun. Uh, so, I would uh, I would recommend trying mason bees and blue orchard bees in the little houses that they live in. That's uh, num that's another fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see a couple options here. Um, let's see, let's talk about. I'm just switching gears like too fast. Maybe we want to talk more about Macy bees. It's okay. We want it to be something that you're interested in for sure. So keep asking questions if you have them. Um, one thing that we wanted to talk about is bee stings and protective clothing. Of course, if you're new to bees, you know, bees sting. They do. That's part of their biology to do that. Um, and they sting because of they don't want to sting you because they die when they sting you, but we want to, as beekeepers, since they die when they sting us, it, we want to do everything possible to prevent them from stinging so that they can keep going and stay alive, right? right. When one bee stings, it's not a big deal. The colonies, <laughs> you look cute in that hat, Stan. <laughs> Anyway, the colony still will keep going if they lose a few bees, but um, we can do things to avoid stinging, like wearing appropriate protective clothing. So protective clothing includes beekeeping gloves like these. These um, ones are ventilated, but they're a kid skin probably or leather, and then they have a sleeve on them. So a lot of people are tempted to just wear a, a glove, like a garden glove or something, but it's actually pretty important to protect your wrist from ge getting stung. That's why bee gloves have some kind of sleeve on them. I've done DIY where I just sewed a sleeve onto a pair of garden gloves and that works okay. These ones have an elastic um, on the cuff here to hold it tight to your arm. So the bees can't crawl under there and sting. So you want something with a glove and a cuff. Yeah. Right. And then Stan sometimes works bees with gloves, sometimes without, but you probably need to have some around just in case. And then there's different varieties of beekeeping protective clothing and they range in coverage. So I sew these cute. They're so cute. They're these beekeeping veils. We have these ones 
are probably for women more, but we have some manly ones too. And these are cool because um, they're just really minimal protective clothing. They would cover your face and ha they have a drawstring here and just keep that protected. And then you could wear your own long sleeve shirt and pants with that. Um, so this, we recommend that you buy this. This is on our website, thehoneycompany.com. Um, and you can get those if you want to buy from one from us. Um, they also make beekeeping jackets, which is kind of like a hoodie sweatshirt with a face protection. And it goes down to your waist and then stops. And that is the next level up for beekeeping protection. So the lowest is kind of just the veil. And then the next one up is a jacket. And then the most coverage or protection would come with a full beekeeping suit that goes from head to toe. And they have elastics around the ankles so you could wear it with your own boots and then be protected from head to toe. The trouble is that um, it's really, really, really hot. <laughs> in Utah when it's like 100 plus degrees and then you're keeping your bees in the middle of the day because that's when they're the happiest to have you keep them and you're wearing a full bee suit it gets really hot so that's the reason you know not everyone wants to wear the full bee suit all the time because it's hot and it's like it restricts your movement so you just have to gauge what you get based on your own comfort level right if you're nervous about keeping bees maybe you want the full suit if you're more comfortable you may you know scale back and just use a veil um i can you hand me that again i um keep this in my car i like this particular one i have some that have a rigid wire and this one is a flexible wire um a cable in there instead and i like to just have one of these in my car in case um, I need to film stand, catching a swarm or something spontaneous, I have one with me all the time. So it's nice. We have full bee suits too and jackets, but it's nice to have this to keep in the car. Okay. Oh, Laura says it's adorable. Thanks, Laura. Okay. Um, so we talked about those different... Okay. So we talked about gloves and suits. And the next thing to help bees prevent prevent them from stinging you is a honeybee smoker. So Stan, does it harm bees to smoke them? Uh, no, it doesn't. They, um, the bees, I mean, you could overdo it, but uh, generally speaking, the smoke doesn't cause the bees any harm. So you need a smoker. It's an essential part of your beekeeping equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see what, uh, if you, uh, if you if you have one of these then you don't need to rely as much on one of these <laughs> if you uh if you uh, uh well let, let me see so beekeepers um once you gain some experience with beekeeping you'll find that the bee veil uh that you use is uh um, well, what am I trying to say? You don't necessarily need the full-on bee suit, right? Most of the time you can get by with just a bee veil if you want, or maybe just a jacket, a half suit, right? Um, so by all means, dress up to the point where you feel safe and comfortable so you're, you're not afraid of your bees, you're not getting stung. But uh, the more experience you gain, the less clothing that you're going to need to protective clothing mm -hmm. and so part of that has to do with your use of the smoker if you start your smoker before you open the beehive very important um, then you don't need as uh, substantial of a bee suit as you you might think so mm -hmm. beginning beekeepers i've noticed are a little bit more inclined to put on the full suit um, and uh, i have full bee suits and i know when to wear them so if we are uh, in a big hurry and the weather's not good, you get you get so you just intuitively know when the bees are going to be mad and when they're not. Mm -hmm. And as a commercial beekeeper, you don't have a choice always when you get into the bees. Sometimes we're moving bees in the middle of the night. Sometimes we're moving bees or uh, putting queen cells in all night. And uh, so... Or during a rainstorm. Or during the rain you know, or mm -hmm. snow or whatever. So, but uh, the smoker is an important thing. So you'll you'll uh, know that if you use your smoker correctly, 
then you're a lot less likely to need gloves all the time and a really heavy duty B suit or B belt. So, so, and then for size of smoker, there's a lot of sizes. Like one day we should do a video of your smoker collection. It's pretty cool. Okay. But this one in particular and is a really great beginning smoker. Um, and so you would want to get the name of this, if it helps you, is a four by six smoker and it has leather bellows and a guard. So there's a canister inside and then this guards. So sometimes this is a metal piece and sometimes it's just wires, but you want, that's what you want is a metal guard on the outside. So you don't start fires or burn yourself as easily. And that, cause there's a fire in that can, right? When you're using it. And then often when smokers come new inside, well, he has some burlap as fuel. And um, often they'll come with like a little metal disc that fits inside of this can. And when you get that, you're going to need to pull that out. And then it has like little legs on it and you need to fold them down. And then the legs go down first so that there's a gap between um, the bottom of the smoker and the tray where the fire is, because that allows air to flow through and you can get fire and smoke. You know, it kind of increases that air buffer. So the bellows pump air through this tube here oops, into the can of the smoker and then through the fuel and the fire and then out. And when you're smoking bees, you want to use cool smoke, not don't let flames come out of there. We'll do another video later about how to use a smoker or we have videos on YouTube already that we can talk about that more. Okay, and the last piece of beekeeping equipment that you need is a hive tool. You'll need this every time you open a hive. And so when, as far as beekeeping tools go, Get, get a couple of hive tools. You'll need it all the time. And it's really good as a paint scraper. <laughs> so you'll use it for other stuff. And then you need, but you need to keep one with your beekeeping stuff, maybe in your barn hive if you have one. <laughs> right. Yeah. You'll need that to open the hive every time you go beekeeping. So four tools, mm -hmm. uh, four pieces of equipment that you're going to need. Two of those are clothing. You'll need the veil and you need gloves. And then you need your smoker and a hive tool. Those are the essentials. There's lots of other things that you can get go through a bee catalog looking at and thinking, oh, do I need one of those? Am I, am I, am I going to be successful uh, if I don't have that tool or this item? So there's only four, uh, four essential uh, beekeeping uh, tools that you need. Okay, so just I sometimes when I'm talking, it's hard to find the pictures, but here's a picture of a smoker that's brand new and it has this guard here. And then this is the disc that I'm talking about. And these legs are not folded out now, but after this is what it looks like after you fold them out. So you could put that into the bottom of the smoker and um, be able to, let's see, get that airflow. Okay. So they're like the feet on the grate in your fireplace, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got the little smoker tube uh, here in the bottom where the air comes through. When you pump the bellows, it pushes air out the bottom of this and then into the can. And so if you don't have that space underneath the grate, then you can't get air in there. Okay. All right. Awesome. So now um, we'll have a checklist posted that you can just download. So after this video's over, probably tomorrow we'll post some sh like notes on the show or whatever. So underneath there'll be a checklist for buying your first hive and it will list all these things so you don't have to keep track of everything. Okay, so Antonio asks, I've seen a video of an oxalic acid smoker. Have you ever used oxalic acid in your hive? So do, could yeah. you mean an oxalic acid fogger, like an insect fogger, or are you talking about like the copper pipe kind of situation? We, we use oxalic acid. I've used all of the uh, forms that it can be applied to bees. So there's the, there's the uh, fogger or the vaporizer. Uh, I, I have, there's several different ways of doing that. No, so we're talking about oxalic acid use for varroa mites. Mm -hmm. We're using this to kill varroa. And there's the dribble method. You can mix oxalic acid with some sugar syrup and dribble it on the bees. And then there's also the uh, oxalic acid and glycerin, 
mixture that you would soak into a uh, shop towel or uh, there's a couple other things a Swedish sponge maybe uh, so we have used the uh, vaporizer or fogger for uh, uh, treatment for varroa mites yes it works good there's the tons copper of type pipe and blow torch yeah and they made their things. own before they had the little frying pan or they had the battery operated uh, um, fogger or a propane then we made our own i just took a copper pipe and uh, put a little uh, soldered little elbow on it with a cap on there we'd fill up the cap with uh, oxalic acid put that in the entrance to the hive there and then hit the end with a blow torch and vaporize it and it works, it, and it works well. It kills the, the veromites. That worked good, but it was uh, uh, dangerous. You know, I'm, I mean, as far as you don't want to start a grass fire doing that. Uh, you got your blowtorch out there, so it's, it could be a problem. Yep. Um, anyway, so there's, and it wasn't very efficient. If you get a lot of hives, if you've got just one or two hives, um, works perfectly fine. Uh, you don't have to have an expensive frying pan that you hook up to a car battery that you take around with you. Um, but uh, there's a ton of videos out there on uh, how to use oxalic acid. Mm -hmm. We just, have some, and too. we have some on our website, mm -hmm. so you can watch those or some others. Yeah. So, and again, if you're wanting more information about treating for mites, you can sign up. We have an online course called "Are My Bees Healthy?" and um, I can put a link to that too. But it would go through like how to monitor for mites, how to treat for mites, you know, whether to treat for mites or be treatment free. All, all of the information about mites are on in that course. And so it has a ton of detail and will help you manage that in your bees. If that is interesting to you, it's a really useful course. And then it comes in a bundle with six courses total. So it's just one of many, many resources that we have there. Okay, so we recommend that course to learn more about treating for varroa mites, more about what we do with that and all of that. Um, oh, wait, we forgot to talk about another piece of equipment. Well, he showed this feeder to you here, but um, so this is a frame feeder and it is one that replaces a frame in the colony. Um, and so this is one type of feeder, but you're going to need a feeder for your colony, especially if you start a package because um, in our area, anyway, the packages usually come and then there's winter weather afterwards. So we feed them to help them get through that. So I just wanted to show you some pictures of some feeder styles that we have. So this is called a division board feeder and he has it. This is what is we have here. It holds a gallon of syrup. The deep one does. And then you could buy it with or without these. These are called caps and ladders. Um, and so you can use those. Those help prevent bees from drowning. These The disadvantage of these is that bees drown in them. The advantage is that they're pretty cheap. <laughs> and um, let's see, this is what it looks like after the caps and ladders are on, but you can also like fill it with sticks or something else like that, and then pour the syrup in and it will help the bees be able to climb out. So some other feeders, this is a mason jar feeder, and this, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. This just, what we have here is that these are double nukes, like um, Antonio was talking about earlier. Oh, here, let me uncheck that. So, um, you can see better. But there's two nukes in one box, and there's like a board splitting them in half. But so this is a mason jar feeder, and basically there's a hole in the lid, and so it's a mason jar that we've just taken and poked holes in the lid of the jar, and then turned it upside down, and by suction it just holds that syrup in, and the bees can poke their little tongues up and get um, syrup as they need it that way. So this is an inexpensive way to do it too. This is called a Boardman feeder and it's a little piece of plastic here that screws onto a mason jar. And then the front end of it fits into the hive like that. And this can be good in the spring, but in the fall, um, there's a danger of the bees robbing when the feeder is outside of the hive with this Boardman feeder or this mason jar feeder. Um, this is a baggy feeder, so you can take a baggy, just a Ziploc baggy, put, this just has water in it, but you could put sugar syrup in that and then slice it and then the bees can slowly get the feed from that. Also, that's one that most of all of us have in our homes, maybe if we use plastic. This is a sugar cake and sometimes 
This is just, we mixed sugar with water and formed it into a brick and let it dry out most of the way. And so this is a way to feed without adding more water to the hive, which sometimes we try to feed before winter. So bees, we try not to feed during the winter because it's hard for bees to get the water out, but it, this was an emergency situation. So we tried this um, fondant or sugar cake that worked too. And um, this is, oh, our barn hive, which of course has the built-in feeder. You just open the bay and you can pour the syrup directly in. Some more pictures of that. And um, this is our video about feeding bees and it has, it shows how to use all of those different types of feeders. Anything else you wanna say about feeder stem? I just dominate the conversation. This is how it is in our marriage too though. I'm the talker, he's the listener. <laughs> Uh, maybe this time about feeding bees. So I have right now a bunch of bees that are probably going to die because they're not going to get fed and they're out of feed. Mm -hmm. So the problem is feeding bees in the middle of the winter in our climate anyway. When you introduce some feed to the bees, they've got to process it. Now mm -hmm. they've got indigestibles in their guts and they can only hold that for so long. And if the weather's bad, they can't go out for a cleansing flight. Now you've created dysentery. So uh, only would you uh, be an emergency there, they're out of feed, would you even uh, think about feeding bees this time of year? Ideally, we want to feed the bees in the fall mm -hmm. before they're, they're, uh, eight. they want to be able to uh, dry out the syrup, turn it, into, uh, turn it into something that has a moisture content that won't ferment over the winter. And it, ideally, they'd be able to cap it over before the weather got bad and uh, they would be able to fly also to get rid of the the uh, processing uh, so uh, before the weather locks them in for the winter time. Mm -hmm. so we don't want to feed bees this time of year unless we have to and if you're going to do that then let's give them some dry sugar you, know, you could just take a piece of newspaper and put it on here and dump some dry feed in it. you can pour granulated sugar right in your in your feeder if you need to so sometimes we do things like that. So. And um, B, well, it's interesting because every time in the spring when we start talking about bees for the year, people automatically want to know about preparing for winter, right? Yeah. Like you, in, in our area, we have pretty heavy winters. So some areas of the country, it's not like a thing, but here it really is. So we... Um, Anyway, you want to start in the spring to prepare for winter. So that information about preparing for winter is in our online course called Beginning Beekeeping Skills. And it goes through like all the basic, like learning to inspect your hives and all of that. So that's one of our six courses on our website too. So if you want to know more about preparing for winter, take that course and you'll get tons of awesome information. Um, and I think that that is what we have planned for this evening. And But next week on Thursday at 6 o'clock Mountain Time, we're going to have another class like this. So we hope that you join us again um, during that. And we'll be talking about, let's see, make sure I get this right. We're going to be talking about um, what's in a hive. So we'll talk about, um, yeah, things that you expect to encounter in a hive and like what different kinds of comb is and all of that. So please join us again next week and we'd love to uh, bring your questions and we'll hope, we hope we can answer them. Um, we're hoping, if this is successful, we're hoping to keep going and do more videos like this more often, except that right now it's February and it's freezing cold here. So we're doing them in our house, but as the summer goes on, we're hoping to do some that are outside. We set it up so that we have a hive pretty close to this room in our house, but it's just on the outside of the house so that Stan can keep bees out there and I can kind of help monitor the screens and all of that from inside. So um, with that, thank you so much for joining us. And do you have any closing remarks, Stan? <laughs> um, uh... Right, nothing else I can think of directly related to bees right now other than thanks for joining us. We hope you'll uh, come back and uh, uh, and we, we've got some fun stuff planned for you, some good information for you. We hope you enjoy keeping your bees. Yep. All right. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.